Okay, topic four is all about materials. And the first step into being able to use materials is understanding how to classify and identify materials. So this first section of topic four is all about the classification systems that are used for materials. First, let's define a few terms. Uh, you, if you've taken chemistry, you've probably seen these terms and you probably have heard of these before, but we need to specifically be able to identify these. Um, an atom is the smallest chemically separatable particle of an element. After you separate, you can separate it down into electrons and protons and neutrons, but once you do that, um, the atom, it loses its properties. So uh, an atom is considered the smallest chemically separatable. Uh, it consists of a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by an orbiting cloud of electrons. Examples would be carbon, iron, oxygen, uranium, etc. Molecules are the smallest particle of an individual substance that reta uh, retains the properties of the substance, contains one or more, or consists of one or more atoms. Examples here would be water, sodium chloride, Kevlar, uh, Kevlar um, all sorts of polymers are in this category. We're going to get into all of this down the road. Metals, uh, which you're going to need to understand, are particular elements and um, alloys that act as good conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, they consist of co closely packed atoms and tends to exhibit malleable or ductile properties. A term you're going to learn with metals is um, they are uh, atomically kind of like um, there's a it's nucleuses in a sea of electrons. What it means by that is the electrons for metals flow very freely which is why they're so highly conductive. Examples of metals would be iron, silver, and aluminum. There are specific types of elements. Now an alloy the next one down is a substance that's made of one or more metals. It is basically, it's a mixture of a metal and another metal or a metal and something else. Uh, typically made by combining elements uh, when molten to enhance one or more properties of the finished alloy. For example, steel is a combination of iron and carbon and other materials. Other uh, alloys would be brass and solder. Um, and uh, most aluminums, uh, there are there are thousands of different types of aluminums, and all of those aluminums are alloys. Uh, metals typically don't exist very long in their pure state because they'll oxidize very quickly. So alloys are a combination of metals. A lot of times that prevents them from oxidizing or breaking down. Composites are uh, engineered or natural material that's made of two or more materials that may maintain unique chemical or physical characteristics. For example, a man-made uh, composite would be fiberglass. Fiber, you have, um, you have fibers that are a textile, and then you have uh, ceramics that bond everything together. Uh, wood is a, um, a composite material, but it's naturally occurring. You have uh, fibers that make up basically kind of like the, the vessels along the tree and then a lignin matrix that locks everything together. That's what wood is. Concrete is an example. That has um, cements and it has aggregates and it has sands that are all mixed into concrete to give it its strength and structure. Describe a bond as a force of attraction between atoms. Uh, with atomic bonds you have three different ones that we're going to learn about. Ionic, covalent, and metallic. Now ionic bonds are caused by attraction between oppositely charged ions or charged atoms. Covalent bonds are bonds that occur when electrons are shared between atoms. And a metallic bond is kind of like a modified covalent bond and this is a bond that occurs when electrons are shared among multiple atoms. You need to be able to consider and differentiate between these three types of bonds. Know when you see one if it's an ionic bond, a covalent bond, or a metallic bond. Describe how materials are classified into groups according to similarities in their microstructures and properties. Um, there are different categories for separating materials. You have physical properties, chemical properties, mechanical properties. All of these create classification systems. Now, what's important to realize is when you classify a material, the classification that you apply to it needs to apply to more than one material. You cannot have a category that just contains a single item in the category that kind of defeats the purpose. It's kind of like when you are creating a, um, when you're doing an outline of a paper that you're writing, you cannot have, or you're not supposed to have uh, one individual um, item and one thing in a category. There has to be multiples. 
explain that several classifications are recognized, but no simple, single uh, classification is perfect. Now, it's easy to classify materials into category, uh, categories, um, but those categories can be very crude in their definition, and there's always going to be some sort of exception or some errors that occur in these classification systems. For example, when you think of um, when you think of uh, ferrous alloys, that is alloys that contain iron, uh, they're all magnetic except for some stainless steels that aren't magnetic. Um, so there's almost always going to be exceptions to uh, rules that are created to classify materials. Describe that for in this course materials are classified into groups timber, metals, plastics, ceramic, food, and composites. Some of these groups have subdivisions. In this class, we won't be addressing food sciences at all, but we will be briefly mentioning it. Um, so we're not going to go into food, but we will be going into all the other categories. Now, within timber, you have two main categories, natural wood and then man-made composite woods. Uh, man-made composite woods would be like plywood and OSB, which are made from pulling apart individual um, parts of trees and then gluing them together somehow. Metals, you have ferrous, uh, which is metals that contain iron, and then non-ferrous metals. Plastic, you have thermoplastics and thermoset plastics. Ceramics, you have earthenware, porcelain, stoneware, and glass. And then with textiles, you have natural fibers and synthetic uh, fibers. Composite materials are usually difficult, if not impossible, to classify because composite materials are made of multiple things. So um, there's a lot of variability in composites, and, and that's where um, materials science and materials engineering really comes into play. They develop composite materials. There's not too many pure materials that are being discovered these days, but the material engineers are designing composites 90% um, of the time. Timber. Like we said, natural wood is what comes right off of a tree, and this is a picture of plywood. You'll see it is layers of wood that are connected by a glue. Metals, ferrous metals, uh, which are iron-based, they are magnetic, and they do oxidize fairly quickly in rust. Non-ferrous metals are non-magnetic, and, well, not necessarily non-magnetic, but they're not iron-based. Gold is non-ferrous, silver is non-ferrous, um, other alloys, um, that are multiple metals mixed together are non-ferrous. Thermoplastics um, are a type of plastic that will remelt. Um, thermoplastics melt down when heated, so th those are probably the most common plastics that you're going to encounter. Uh, anything that can be heated, formed into a shape, and then melted down and reformed into a different shape, that is a thermoplastic. A thermoset, and a common example of thermoset plastics, are, is a material called Bakelite. <coughs> bakelite is a plastic, but it does not melt down. Um, it starts as a powder, and typically these are made in high-pressure um, compression molds. And this material is put in, it's heated, and, it's, and a pressure is applied, and it fits into the form. Um, and then when the mold is separated, the part comes out, and that part is a thermoset, which means no matter how much heat you apply to that part, it will never melt down. You cannot easily recycle thermoset plastics. They just don't melt down. Um, so they're not nearly as common as thermoplastics because they're usually much more difficult to work with. Ceramics, you got earth, earthenware, porcelain, stoneware, and glass. Now, um, earthenware and porcelain start out as kind of like a clay material, and then they are heated uh, to, to create a shape. Glass is similar, but it's heated to a point where it, it, it very much um, changes the chemical composite um, composition of the material. When you make glass, everyone knows that glass is made out of sand, but there's a lot of other ingredients that go into it. Um, sodas, limes, all, well, soda as in um, like uh, chemicals like soda ash. Uh, and then lime, as in the the stone lime, which is added uh, as a as a strengthener. Plus, also other metals. A lot of times are added to glass to colorize them. Um, for example, if you add, <coughs> I believe it's copper to the small pieces of copper into glass, it'll t it'll tint the glass green. Uh, so there's a lot of other uh, metals that'll tint glass. I think gold will tint it red. Um, and it's, 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 it's a, glass making is a very interesting process. Stoneware is um, very different. It involves a lot of carving of uh, solid stone. Textiles, you have uh, synthetic fibers, which are usually nylon, rayon. Nylon was the first synthetic fiber that was created. 
um, and there are other synthetic fibers. Uh, Kevlar is a synthetic fiber. Um, natural fibers, you have, you know, the big ones, cotton, wool, hemp, all of those are naturally occurring and they are refined by humans to use uh, in clothing and other um, processes that involve textiles. Now composites are unique because co composites are a combination of natural and or synthetic materials. Uh, we were talking about how composites um, like, like fiberglass are a combination of ceramics and, and textile fibers, but there are lots of other ways uh, that composites are created. Now composites are usually optimized for a specific purpose. Fiberglass works really good to create structures. It's extremely light, but there are applications that it's not very good for. Um, uh, concrete and reinforced concrete uh, if you actually ever see like a, um, a, a bridge being uh, taken apart or a building being taken apart and you see them taking apart and busting up the concrete, con you'll, you'll notice that there's metal in that concrete. You have reinforcement bars, rebar, that's where it gets its name from, uh, is embedded in concrete to give it structure because concrete has an extremely high um, compressive strength. It, it resists compressive loads very good. You can have a, a huge amount of weight on um, concrete pylons for bridges and it'll hold it up. But concrete has a very low tensile strength, which means um, it, it, you, it can be pulled apart very easily. So what rebar does is it, is it reinforces the concrete and it kind of locks into the concrete. And when um, a material that has rebar in it is, being, is undergoing um, tensile uh, forces, the, the rebar is what's, re, uh, what's, what's holding the concrete together, not the actual, um, not the actual concrete material itself.